Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to number, I don't know, 437, some number, the 40-something of the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesdays webinar series. We've been having a whole lot of fun. We're talking about just about whatever happens to cross my mind when we have our planning meetings, which can be a lonely, lonely time some days. However, today, I've got a couple of good friends with me, and we're going to have a little fun. Number one, we've got Alex Hartman, whose title on the screen is Customer Service Technologist for Nautel, but you may know Alex as mad scientist, uh, contract engineer, uh, internet profile and personality, and the guy with the really cool uh, home office. Uh, Alex, I think you need some more raspberry pies. How many, how many of those do you have around you right now? Uh, 22. <laughs> because There's a whole everybody container needs... of them right there. <laughs> That's me reaching up to uh, unplug the uh, listening, the home listening device, if you will, because uh, uh, when I say she Alex, will not be named. <laughs> well, when I say Alex, she's just uh, assuming she the last it for you. Yeah. That's it. All right. Also, and, and that's kind of cool because we are talking about moving signals from here to there. In this case, from uh, my home office to wherever Alexa happens to be based. But uh, we've also got Josh Bone, president and CEO of the recently rebanded Max Connect Group. And my running joke is that this has turned out to be a Josh and Alex month. Um, and, and Josh, you, two weeks in a row, man. I, two I, weeks I, in I, a row, encore performance. You're going to start charging me royalties or appearance fees pretty soon. Or your attendance uh, is going to start dropping off really quick if you don't start getting some different guests. Yeah, so, so <laughs> on that note, folks... <laughs> Don't bail on us next week. We'll have different guests. Uh, we've got Tom Ray talking about uh, some contract engineering challenges, problems, and you know there's going to be some more stories and how I blew this stuff up or why I shouldn't have blown this stuff up. Uh, I, I don't haven't seen uh, if he is in the audience list. I probably should keep or pay attention to this. I don't see him right now. Shane Tobin, uh, if you hear him, he's probably out uh, looking at his garage wall right now. But uh, Speaking of blowing stuff up, that's a whole different concept. Anyway, uh, so let's get rolling. We're here to talk about STLs, moving signals from point A to point B. As always, if you're new to our webinars, then uh, welcome aboard. And uh, by all means, we try to make these as interactive as we can on your little control dashboard thingy. You've got a place to ask questions. Type them in there and uh, they pop up on my screen. I'll answer them as soon as I can or wherever they fit in. Um, shout out to Mark Voris, who's already used the interface to say good day. So good day, Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, hey, Mark. Uh, one other thing, you see the little hand wavy icon up there. If you uh, click on the hand wavy icon and you've got a microphone, we are more than happy to unmute you and make you part of the conversation. Uh, we ask that you keep it PC, but uh, we don't really care. Oh, this is being recorded. So yeah, we do really care. I got to say that for the marketing guys. Speaking of marketing guys, special shout out to Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester, who is the guy in the background that makes all the stuff happen. And uh, he's the one throwing chats at me all the time to actually make sure that I keep things moving. So if it starts to drag, that's because I'm ignoring Ed's directions. No, not because anything he did, but Ed, thanks for everything you do to make this stuff happen. You're very welcome. Nope. Ah, there. Ed, Ed has a microphone. Ed's from beyond, yay. <laughs> Ed's also got a radio voice. He's pretty good at this stuff. But uh, remember also, if you're an SBE member, that uh, Nautel webinars do qualify for half a credit under the uh, under the recertification schedule, Category I. So make sure to keep a note in that on your notepad or scrap paper or spreadsheet, whatever you use to keep track of that stuff. Uh, my certification is up in... Uh, November, December, I guess I should actually start on a spreadsheet. What but, year is uh, it? What year is what? Mine's <laughs> <Mine's> up uh, <laughs> this year. <laughs> this year or next? I can't remember. Larry Wilkins would have to answer that. Or I'll, I'll look at the look at my, uh, what do you call it, little certificate at some point. Anyway, so we're here to talk about, about STLs and getting the signals back and forth. Um, We'll talk a little bit about license versus unlicensed uh, benefits, drawbacks, wired, wireless, uh, what kind of wireless if we go that way. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that can make wireless an issue. We'll talk about the benefits and drawbacks of uh, laying stuff on the ground, whether it be copper or fiber. So a little bit of everything. Um, I picked you guys because you uh, both have 
a little bit of a history coming at it from opposite ends. So Josh, you're kind of sort of <laughs> will, willingly or otherwise, you've kind of become the Marty guy. Kind of, yeah. We uh, we kind of picked up where uh, SRS left off when Rick Neese closed down eight years ago. And we do a lot of Marty repair. We've got a lot of institutional Marty knowledge. Uh, Jones has made a lot of modifications over the years to these to make them more reliable, but it is getting a lot harder to fix them. Even the gray ones are, oh, the gray ones are the newer ones. No, the, a lot of the gray ones are still 35 years old. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we get some of those older ones in there and they've got a date code stamped on them from 1977, it's just like, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> So, uh, but, yeah. but in radio, year 77 is not that old. That's very true. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's very true. We, yeah, it's, you know, we've started compiling a short list of things that we just can't fix. Yeah. So, so that is a good thing to just kind of keep in the back of your mind that uh, the, the, and the challenge is STL stuff. It just kind of sits in the corner and does its thing. Yeah. And, you know, you don't really you don't really have a chance to think about it because it doesn't throw off big arcs, farts, flashes, you know, all that great stuff that transmitters do or antenna systems. And, yep. You know, it's so, a forgotten piece of the air chain usually because it right. just works usually until it doesn't. And then when well, it doesn't, people don't really suspect it. Well, and they, they were built to be passively cooled. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at that Marty, if you turn it around, there's not a fan anywhere on that system. And that right. was done because they're forgotten about. And if a fan dies, it'll, you know, then stands to reason your fan dies, your unit's going to die soon after. But mm -hmm. the problem is Marty's were, the way Marty's were built, if anything ever needed a freaking fan, it was a Marty transmitter. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the things is on most of the repairs that we do, not necessarily to the 10s, but to the 15s and the 20s, we will retrofit a fan onto the heat sink on the back to try to extend the life because otherwise the output transistor just gets so hot it cooks itself after 10 years because mm -hmm. people um, inherently shove these into racks and don't leave any vent space. Right. So, and, uh, Curtis Stefan says that his uh, station smarties are beige. Oh yeah, that's those are early '80s models. Yeah, when you get into the bread box STL eights, those are the ones with the '70s date codes on. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've, got a pair, I've got a pair of the beige ones that uh, were the discrete left rights with the combiner, mm -hmm. and, and those combiners are really hard to come by nowadays. Uh, yeah. If anybody needs any, I think we've got five for sale sitting downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. No. So we're, we're not going to let this totally turn into the Josh sales show, but uh, there are no. some cool things that we, well, there are some cool things we will talk about in a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of diplexers, um, and, and it was kind of cool that we uh, got to uh, lead into this. I see I did a terrible job of pasting that image in there, but uh, <laughs> see, this is what happens when I don't send the slide deck to Ed before we go live with it. Oopsie. Um, yeah, you end up with the sales guy doing stuff instead of the guy that actually knows how to do it. Um, but uh, diplex versus dedicated. I mean, a lot of us have seen 900 meg stuff where you got like a Starlink and a Landlink. Of course, that's probably the biggest combination I've encountered over the years. But uh, what, what are the benefits and uh, you know pros and cons sort of thing? You did that, and these slides, I should say, uh, there's a little shout out to uh, John Takash over at Radio One. But these are from a presentation that you and he did for the OAB not too long ago. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was the the Midwest conference in 2019, right before the world exploded. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's. I mean, you know, Alex can can talk a lot about this too. The benefits of you know dedicated versus diplex. Diplex is a a, a cheap and dirty way to get some type of connectivity to your site on your on your analog STL path because it runs in the, the 908 to 920 ISM band. And because of the way it works, it's typically bandwidth limited to right around five megs, which is mm -hmm. enough for telemetry and basic monitoring and things like that. And I've seen people shove an audio stream across it if mm -hmm. it's got a decent amount of buffering. But that's not a... a yeah, anything in the 900 megahertz band, or nothing on it. yeah, right. Anything in the 900 megahertz band, you're not going to get a lot of throughput just because of the nature of how of of the the frequency versus bandwidth. Right. Early and on, when I started my little uh, adventure with uh, you know Ubiquity Wireless many years ago, now I did this exact thing, 
uh, diaplexed it into my existing Marty path uh, using the same dishes and, you know, called microwave, uh, filter company and got the diaplexers, which were more by four times the radio cost, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I put ubiquity, uh, bullet M 900s on there. Yep. That's uh, what we did. And too. I actually managed to get about 16 megabit worth of throughput at a respectable latency, which allowed me to run a couple of codecs through it. Um, and that was my first early test because it was, like you said, cheap and dirty, uh, cheap being relative compared to buying a new Marty at the time, um, right. and, you know, a decade ago. Yeah. And the funny thing is going back a little before that, the the other M company that uh, the builds STL equipment, uh, the, the Landlink, um, the original mm -hmm. ones had about a 500 kilobit bit it was rate. Five, it was 512. Yeah. So it was 256 each way. And it was, right. and, and back in dial up internet day, that was, was lightning fast. Right. And right. I mean, um, even when you get into the HD radio days, I mean, that was the reason that we developed the NRHD, the reliable HD transport system that we've been including since 2009 in a lot of our stuff, because we can repackage the HD data to go over a low bit rate path like that. Yeah. But, but yeah, back then, I mean, that was the best way we had to get data back and forth and you still maintain now, your control of your link not relying on right. public internet or anything like that or a telco or anything like that yeah. yeah right now moving forward a little bit uh the bands expanded a little and things changed and we get into license band versus unlicensed and i see i bodged this one too it's cringing in the background folks guarantee you when we put the slide deck up online it'll be fixed but uh <laughs> so uh so anyway, license versus unlicensed. I mean, my general rule of thumb is if I'm in a really small part of rural wherever, uh, unlicensed band is probably just fine. But that's not always the case, is it? No, not even close. Um, you'd be surprised at the companies that have latched onto that unlicensed band for telemetry of other devices. Um, you know, I've seen some SCADA systems even going that route. Uh, for city water meters, mm -hmm. uh, but though you know, you'd think in rural America and flyover country, if you're going over, you know, three thousand acres of cornfield, you'd be fine. Well, come Irrigation harvest time, control. those John Deere's, the PTOs, are all using unlicensed 2.4 and 5.8 to talk back to the tractor, mm -hmm. and, and you end up with a lot of noise. Uh, so you got to be, you take a little care and consideration to know your environment when you're looking at this. Uh, you really do need to know what you're working with, just like any others. You know, think of it as path study, like you would for a traditional 950 or 6 gig or 7 gig, uh, mm -hmm. or even an 11 gig for television. Uh, you know, you you have to know who your neighbors are, and they may well, not you, list their address. Well, but, and it comes you, down to criticality of the link too. I mean, if it's put being put up as a redundant link to uh, uh, some type of a wireline connection, whether it's fiber or also, you know, a 900 meg RLSTL or something like that. And you don't care if it blips or gets some inter interference once in a while because it's a it's a backup or it's just a telemetry link or whatever, then it might not be that big of a deal. You could probably throw a 5.8 system up, pick a channel so that you're not a jerk and hop all over everybody else and mm -hmm. off it goes. But if right. that's your primary link, and you don't know what else is going on around you, if you haven't done any type of a signal sweep or anything like that, then okay, you know, somebody's gonna end up on top of you or you're gonna end up on somebody on top of somebody else. And that may happen down the road anyway, because the nature of unlicensed, it, it's the wild, wild west. Somebody well, wants to light up on wireless, your channel, too bad. Wireless well, internet um, is a big thing in flyover country too. And yeah. it's call your friends too. When you're thinking about doing this, if you got, if you know there's a wireless internet provider in your neck of the woods, call them and coordinate. Self coordination is half mm -hmm. the battle in this world. Yes. Um, you know, say, hey, I need, you know, my general rule of thumb is because you have a radio that can do 80 megahertz worth of bandwidth, you don't need 80 megahertz worth of bandwidth. You need right. 10. Yes. So make sure you can slide right between their stuff that doesn't interfere with their business model to make sure your business model doesn't get interfered with just the same. Well, and two things to point out here, and, and Brad Roy Roybal made the same comment that rural America has a lot of wireless 5 gig ISPs using PTMP systems that'll put out a lot of RF if there's one near your STL. Mm -hmm. But Even if the there's other, not one near you, you'd be surprised how far off access those things will go. 
Yeah, because again, they're not using, typically they're not using a focused beam like a dish where you no, are they're using a sector there. antenna. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, even with that, uh, you got to be careful because I ran into a situation, we had a, a customer down in uh, not too far outside Indianapolis, not a, you know, unrated market outside Indy, about 50, 60 miles. And they were getting a situation where their audio was, it was just dropping out. It wasn't that it was being stepped on by somebody else. And what it turned out to be was that there was another station with a licensed frequency, but uncoordinated STL running exactly parallel paths with one dish slightly out of whack. And on a windy day, it would move enough to interfere. Yep. Yep. The other thing too is, uh, you know, the, 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 the one un unsuspecting culprit you will run into is actually the cellular companies. Um, a lot of them for out in rural America will only have one point of presence where they'll drag the fiber to and they'll backhaul 10, 12 towers back to that same tower using 5.8 gig. Yep. Mm -hmm. And because it's, you know, it's in the 5.8 band, you'd think you're, you're free and clear. Well, guess what? They have more lawyers than you. They think mm -hmm. they own it. Yeah. And um, Josh, that's something you brought up earlier with signal sweep. Uh, bring somebody in with an analyzer and an antenna, just a broad range antenna, I assume, just to see what is on the spectrum in your area. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you can do a spectral scan and see what's there, we had to do that. We did a, a partial ring for a customer here in Birmingham with 5.8. And it took, I mean, it took a while to find channels because Birmingham is very 5.8 congested. And these are all inside the city limits and it was still very congested and i ended up having to take the the last leg of the link down to five megahertz now it's feeding an am so i was able to make that work but i was only able to use a five megahertz slice without bumping into somebody else or ended up in a radar band or something like that and yeah hmm. so you've got to be able to see what else and you've got to look at it from both ends too because it's a transceiver yeah. So you can't just look at it from the respect of, well, what could this end possibly pick up? Because this is my receive end. Mm -hmm. They're talking both directions. So you have to do a sweep from both sides and say, what can both of these dishes see? And right. who am and I gonna, who's going to screw with me and who am I going to screw with? Here on my university side, it, my noise floor is actually quieter in town at the university than it is at the tower site because of those rural problems. I've got, yeah. you know, PTO yeah. machines. I've got a wireless internet provider. I've got pagers, believe it or not, still a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, they, they, they don't care. Uh, but yeah, my noise floor at what we receive site is actually noisier from a noise floor perspective than my transmit site. Yeah. So now you definitely a, do need to know which side you're working from. And, and there's a note that uh, Joel Epley threw in that you could use the Ubiquiti ISO series dishes with extra side lobe rejection. So again, you can focus your beam to an extent anyway and, and minimize somewhat. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but still, if somebody is behind you or in front of you or off, off axis, just that right amount, uh, it, it's still right. worth your worth your while to do the switch. Just because you did your homework doesn't mean they did. Right. Now, yeah. let's talk about the blurred line of unlicensed versus licensed. Let's call it, talk about six gig. Mm -hmm. Everybody paid in not too long ago, including myself, for a six gig license. Well, recently, FCC has deemed that as perfect use for Wi-Fi for homes mm -hmm. uh, for the next generation of wireless. So now that you have a $10,000 licensed, unlicensed link. Yeah. Uh, so be, pay attention to what's happening in that world because you're going to start seeing a lot of these mesh Wi-Fi routers in people's houses causing problems for your licensed link. Yep. Yeah, and there'll um, be a lot of access points springing up as people try to put coverage in the backyard, so to speak. Already happening in my neck of the woods because Spectrum is handing out uh, Wi-Fi 6 routers for you know a, a fee with the mm -hmm. mesh routers to cover larger homes and farms. Yeah. Oh, one of the things, too, that Brad mentioned is that uh, some of the newer Ubiquity radios had the built-in or spectral scanner for the five band that's accessible via the web UI for the, uh, for the device. Yep, and, the, and the, the, uh, the, the 5X series, which I've become a fan of, yes. uh, will do it in real time without interrupting the signal that's currently online. So it's automatically scanning the band with a third radio to see what the best channel is available. That's actually mm -hmm. what we used when we did our link 
was the we put the five X's in and it, it, it worked great. And every once in a while, I'll just pop into it and I'll do a screen cap and look and say, oh, hey, there's 17 new signals from the last time I scanned. Right. And it's just right. it's it's crazy how much they pop up and an hour later they disappear. Yeah. Right. And, and with 5G coming online, you'll actually start seeing a lot of harmonics. I've yeah. seen that already. Yep. Mm hmm. So it is definitely something you really, really need to be aware of. And and like I said, this uh, although the slide is licensed versus unlicensed, this is going to there's going to be some bleed over into license band too, mm -hmm. as we move forward to some extent. Uh, yes. Also, speaking of that though, and this is something for Josh uh, may be able to address. Uh, Mark Boris mentions encounter problems with railroads because they use a lot of 5.8 for track switching. And yeah. I, I just I pick you because I know Birmingham's like train central. Oh yeah, well, and that's see that that is what a lot of what we saw on that link was. It was the rail yards because we were mm -hmm. shooting over two different rail yards in the directions that we were going to do that link, and I ended up using the final leg was from the base of an AM tower to a building, and it was like 150 yards, and I ended up using a 60 gig building bridge for that, and it was you know I'm it ended up being like 15 feet off the ground, but it was only going about 150 yards across a field, and that worked great. But that's about the distance that that radio is good for, because in a hard rain, 60 gig goes away. In a light rain, 60 gig goes away. Yeah, so piece of paper. what the cool thing about that, what, that particular radio is, is it actually has a 5 gig radio built into it as a backup. Hmm. And you actually pair both of them. The, th yeah. the throughput goes down. At 60 gigs, you're getting 2 gigabits bidirectional. At 150 feet so it's massively speed or it's massive speed but the the frequency is so high and so delicate that you can't really maintain that speed but if it rains you don't want to lose your link but if your right. bandwidth degrades to 60 mags okay you've still got a link there if you're shoving two gigs through it all the time you got other problems yeah. so well, and for most broadcast streaming purposes, especially radio, you're not going to be anywhere near that no. bandwidth requirement. No, and and that was those were handy because they were they were inexpensive, they were small, and it was I mean it, I used it. They were you know Ubiquity markets them as a building bridge, and that's essentially right. what I used it for. But the five eight links, yeah, the shooting over the rail yards while we were putting them up and getting them aimed and everything. I actually had the tower guy aim it down slightly for a second. We did a scan and it just turned into a brick wall straight across. Yeah. All the oh, five eight frequencies were just maxed out. Yeah, so, we did a, a 900 meg uh, link shooting over an Air Force base out west once. And uh, that was its own <laughs> particular challenge too. We had so, a link in Delaware that uh, it was a 900 meg link that was pointed north toward Dover Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And every afternoon it would unlock. It was a Starlink and it would unlock for probably 15 minutes. Lock, unlock, lock, unlock and take the station off the air. And I fought it and my boss and I kept going around about it. And I, I ended up making a phone call to a really, really, really smart engineer. And I said, this is what I'm at. And he's like, is there any military around there? I said, yeah. Well, which direction is it in? I said, the received dish is pointed toward an Air Force base. He's like, what's your polarity? I said, horizontal. Or I said, what's your polarity? I said, vertical. He said, flip it and lower the dish to right above the tree line. And we did that and it went away. Yeah. Because all the military stuff was vertically polarized that was running in mm. those bands. So you flip the polarity, drop it down. It reduces the horizon. It was only a 1.6 mile shot or something like that. But that's something else to look at. The military, if you're shooting over a base or an arsenal or a depot or anything, they can do what they want. And they'll even, if you're, even if you're 90 miles outside of it on a glide path for an Air Force base, mm -hmm. they will they will know you are there and they you know they are there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> things don't work and they make sure they don't work for you. Yeah. Uh, but that, that brings up a point, though, is when you're planning this, a lot of guys will say, well, I've got a 500 foot tower. My antenna takes up top 60 feet. I'm going to put my wireless right below the FM. Don't do that. No, no. Uh, you know, you only go as high as you need to be and allow for tree growth. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. is, you don't want to deal with it for 10 years. Make sure you can figure out in your neck of the woods, how long does it take for an oak tree to grow? How long does it yeah. take for an evergreen to grow? So you want to go just above that to buy you the time because trees will eventually come into 
right. the path. Not direct either. You make sure you got your side lobes depending on how long your shot is. If it's 15 mile shot, that gets pretty wide at 5.8 even. Yeah, you yeah. Know? and so, we'll talk well, about the, the different eye zones and that yep. stuff yep. in a couple of sides too. Um, and that was, uh, but that brings back uh, one of the points you were talking about, bring it as high as you need to, reminded me of something I meant to uh, catch when you mentioned it earlier was uh, make the bandwidth absolutely no more than you need plus 20% headroom, give or take. Right. Some number, pick, pick a number, but uh, the like tighter- I said, you don't need is, 80 megahertz, you only need 10 right. yeah. for and the a lot of what broadcast is doing. The more rugged it'll be. Yep, right. So, and, and in some of these newer radios, um, like the, the Air Fiber 5X, for instance, or even some of the uh, Dragon Wave and Lego Wave, the, the licensed stuff, you can only go down to 10 or 8 megahertz. You can't go any lower. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but if you think about it, like the uh, the Ubiquity 5X, 10 megahertz is still 160 megabit of throughput. Yeah, yeah, more than enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're getting, you know, almost wire speed at 100 meg through that link, I don't think you need much more. So. Now we get talking about the, uh, and of course I, I've told my joke eight times this year, so I'm not going to tell my fiber joke again today. I'll Come let on. somebody Come else. Come on, do okay. it. Come on. Just one. So if you're going for a walk in the woods and you're worried about getting lost, coil up a piece of fiber optic cable, stick it in your pocket. When you get, when you do inevitably get lost, just lay it out on the ground. Half an hour later, a backhoe will come by to cut it. And you can get a lift. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care how many times you told it. It's still funny. <laughs> Here's my fiber in the back of those next door. So they found me. <laughs> there you go. And and one of a uh, contractor I, I talked to quite a bit in, uh, in in Wisconsin has started posting uh, pictures on his Facebook about the South Central uh, South Central Wisconsin backhoe on its hunt for fiber and uh, mm -hmm. and coax. Yeah. I found a so, cheaper uh, and easier method to that joke is they don't care about so much the fiber. All you need is the transceiver, and they find you, you still. <laughs> So uh, anyway, point being, I, and I mean, Josh, this is one of the things you guys do a lot of uh, LTE type modems. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a little more than that. And, and I know I've got a slide coming up where we'll talk about it. Uh, but uh, LP or point to point versus LTE versus uh, hardwire, um, supplemental replacement, how, how, what would your preference be? I mean, <laughs> Point to point is what we always recommend to people because you control your link. You know, wireline is fine if you've got a reliable backup. You know, I, I'm never a fan of one way to connect anything. If you've only got fiber and the South Central Wisconsin backhoe comes and chews your fiber up, then you got nothing. If you've only got a point to point, and somebody pops up on your channel and the rest of the channels are full, well, then you're screwed. If you've only got LTE and the carrier goes down, again, you got nothing. Any combination of these is fine because that oh. increases your reliability, the number of nines on your reliability significantly. What always <laughs> makes me nervous is when people say, well, I've got a, I've got a cable modem with the transmitter site and my DS or my brick link runs just fine. Yeah, it does until something happens and, you know, one of the cable transceivers on the line blows up, then you're just right. hosed. Well, so that's I, the... go ahead, Alex. I've, I've got five internet connections into my house, including Max Connect, including Spectrum, St uh, SpaceX Starlink, uh, University Fiber, and, and everything else. You know, at one point, I actually had three of the five go down because of one carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to know your upstream just the same. Around here in my neck of the woods, Spectrum uses AT&T's fiber. AT&T's fiber also serviced the university. That mm -hmm. fiber got cut. So three, three of the five went down in an instant. Yeah. So because... And people, and people say radio is incestuous. <laughs> right, exactly. Realize that there's only four or five major backbone carriers for the global internet. So if yeah. your cellular interconnect is using AT&T fiber, they, they, they're supposed to have diversification. They're supposed to have yeah. backups, but they oversubscribe. So <laughs> they'll fill up the backup pipe instantly on a failure. Uh, Max Connect obviously will get through because it'll bump your phone call. But, <laughs> the, uh, you know, but my cable modem was useless, even though it was linked. 
it was mm -hmm. down, it was upstream from there. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Max Connect was oversubscribed a little bit. My saving grace at that point was Starlink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so make sure path diversity goes all the way up, not just because you have the cable modem versus the phone company. They right. still travel the same pole. Yeah. Yeah. And that comes back to, you know, the, what you were talking about earlier with one provider subbing off the, the cable for or the, or the fiber or whatever from another provider. So it may not be enough to have a service from two providers if mm -hmm. it's all traveling over the same backbone. Right. right. Well, no, I mean, also, well, and that's the other part of that is, is you know, something even closer to home. If, if all of your lines are fed overhead, they're all coming in on the same pole. One drunk knocks mm -hmm. a pole down. If they're all wireline services, then that's going to go down. You know, yeah. if you, if, you know, further upstream, if, if you have a major fiber cut or a fiber, you know, switch failure or something like that, then yeah, it's, it, it may take down multiple services, even if you are diversified between wireless LTE and whatever, you know, Starlink would be about the only option there because it's coming off the bird. Right. And that's, you know, but nobody, you know, who wants to pay the, the Hughes net prices for the Hughes net service or whatever other satellite, you know, insert random satellite provider here. Right. Yeah. You know, well, I, and I mean, you're, you know, you're never going to get a hundred percent redundant unless you've got yeah. like a hardwired CD player or USB stick, like in the case of our transmitters with uh, audio at the site and then a, and a silence detector. Yeah, but right. uh, but you do all have you do some add, you, all you can do is add nines to the end of the list. You'll never make a hundred percent even no. with that. Right. No. And I, I mean, well, like, yeah. For us, we've got hardwired fiber because, and we'll talk about the the path to our or the the site that I uh, play with in my spare time, infinite amounts of spare time. But uh, <laughs> we, we'll talk about that in a little bit and why we've got a hardwired fiber link. And, and Josh, you and I may be talking about that in the near future once we get a little budget spare. Because, okay. uh, yeah, we've got no backup there. Gotcha. Um, well, we do have backup. We have USB stick. We've got a playlist built into the transmitter, et cetera, and so on. But uh, so one of the things that you hear a lot of people, well, I can get a LTE modem from anywhere for next to nothing. So what's the difference? Um, you can get an LTE modem from anywhere next to nothing. And I've had people tell me that, and I tell them, okay, that that's great. Have a nice day. The big difference is when you've got a consumer level LTE and you end up in a crowded environment or the, the cellular carrier has something go on and it forces an election and it's going to kick those consumer devices off because they're, you know, in that particular portion of the network, there are thousands of things connected to that particular tower at that given time. Mm -hmm. Prioritized LTE lives in its own segmented tier of the network and you know we're what max connect has isn't quite first responder level but it's the next tier down below that the right. the lte tiers are some so segmented in something like 13 different tiers and the consumer level stuff is down around tiers one and two and our stuff is up pushing you know 11 12 so there's right. quite a bit of difference there so and, you're, you're the difference between being able to do a remote at the Indy 500 and not being able to make a phone call. Yes, and and yeah. we've done that successfully for many years. And you know, we've got you know, and then also just from from you know experience and deployment, you know, I've got multiple stations that are running these as backups, and you know, they're yeah. using them with various codecs in either standby mode or redundant mode. Mm -hmm. I, I've got I've got a Wisp at my FM site. The Wisp is one of the connections, and I've got two Max Connects in there, and I've got a codec pushing a stream in over all three of them constantly, and yeah. the Wisp goes down routinely, mm -hmm. and my station never hiccups. Now, on the rare occasion where something happens, I've got the same thing. I've got a I've got a solid state recorder and a USB flash drive in there with six hours of programming on it. And the silent mm -hmm. sensor says, hey, this dropped, click, and it switches over to that. Yeah. Another uh, thing Joe, I want to bring up, too, about that is, you know, the, the nice thing about the Max Connect is that it is commercial equipment. It is the cradle point style router with a physical Ethernet port. I, I dare you to walk into a Verizon store and ask him for an Ethernet jack on a hotspot. And, they, <laughs> and that's the thing. There's one that exists that is actually on a hotspot now. It's the Netgear Nighthawk. And we've st we've experimented with some of those. We've actually sold a few to a, a couple of various customers. They do work with our service, and they're kind of neat. 
but mm -hmm. it, the but point there though is is if you're using wireless to connect to doing your remote you're now at the whim of all the cell phones in the same building congesting and making the noise so don't use even local wireless not long shot and point to point but even in your immediate area for yeah. that kind of a thing relying on that you know media converter essentially because you're going from local wi-fi into wireless wan you know well, you're at the wireless whim if you will well what we what we've run into i've gotten calls over the years and i know mike has gotten a bunch of them too from customers who go we tested the max connect at, at at the stadium or the gym before the basketball game or the gym especially before the basketball game and it worked great and you know everybody showed up and and it doesn't work and i don't understand why and whatever and you know we log remote we'll log remotely into the router and look at it and we'll do our speed tests and it's like it, everything's good latency's still low signal level's good there shouldn't be a problem the next question is how are you connecting to it oh well, we're connecting to it with wi-fi yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, Wi-Fi no, at a venue like that, I, and and the, the thing is, and this is something to keep in mind, is if you're, say you're at a gym and there's a thousand people in there and they all have a cell phone in their pocket, and chances are 80% of them have Wi-Fi turned on on their phone. Even if they're not connected to the Wi-Fi at that venue, their phone they're is still hunting. sitting there constantly scanning. So it's yeah. hammering every frequency in the Wi-Fi band over and over and over again looking for something. Mm -hmm. And both and, bands at that because phones are dual band, so 2.4 exactly. and 5.8 just the same. So it's right. hammering everything, and even if you sit your device right next to your router, and you know they're right beside each other, if there's people sitting in front of your press box, those five people are constantly hammering that band. So you're going to get choppy audio, you're going to get inconsistent connection. And on cell phones, there are adapters that you can get that either connect to the lightning jack on an iPhone or connect to uh, a USB-C or micro USB that will break out to a charging port and an Ethernet jack. Yeah. They're like 13 bucks on Amazon. And mm -hmm. I've had multiple people. I'm like, go on Amazon, find one of these, plug it in. It will install a little driver over the air plug it into your router and it'll work perfectly. And every single one of them has called us back and said, our connection issue stopped. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that that's may come a back serious to problem. Something that uh, Joel has mentioned here, having multiple issues with having a 64 kilobit stream stutter and drop out on a regular LTE modem. And at one site had to turn the bit rate down to 16 kilobits before it was reliable. So, Yuck. That's Joel, way low. Joel, Josh's website's bottom corner of the screen. You may want to. Uh, <laughs> give <up. laughs> We can All help right. you. Give us a call. There, there you go. A commercial plug done. Um, Jerry had asked uh, why. Uh, uh, the, oh, that is a good question, too. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, Jerry asked what LTE means. And I haven't Googled it. I don't know. Long term evolution. <laughs> that is that is the that was that the marketing was, guys at work. That was the <laughs> marketing sorry, guys a thousand percent. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to make a comment about that. Matter. But oh, and. One other thing, speaking of that uh, long-term evolution, and, and this is uh, my little uh, plug at our own development folks, uh, because long-term evolution just made me think of the flash-free AUI. Shouldn't have said <laughs> that when Josh was getting ready to take a drink. But, uh, <laughs> I swallowed first. <laughs> well, so last week during the SNMP uh, session, I made the comment that, uh, and, and I meant to make, get to this at the beginning and forgot, but I made the comment that version 5.0, or the latest version of the software, resolved a lot of the SNMP conductivity. And on the NVLT series, that is not the case. Um, version 461 is the most stable at the moment. And yeah, it, it's not ideal. So uh, definitely, if you're looking at SNMP, keep plugging on the, the guys to get that uh, flash free AUI done. Um, yes, I said it out loud. Uh, oh, no. Um, Heretic. So, Got a got a request? Why your uh, Max Connect Wireless website is uh, not secure? It was. Is it? <laughs> so and, and there, let that's me write that knows. down. I will investigate that as soon as we're done. Uh, and Brian Hines wants to know: Do you work in Canada or are you U.S. only? You're you're uh, no, in a lot of countries. Yeah, uh, well, not a lot of countries. We do have Canada and we do have Mexico. So yeah, okay. we we will work in Canada. So okay, there are a lot of countries in North America. Then let's put it yes, that way. Yes, we've we've got most of North America. Yeah. All At right. one point, I think I heard something about the UK. No, you didn't. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> 
And if, and if you did, it was a lie. Mm. There you go. All right. So the questions, these are, I, I sat down and it's like, what questions would I ask if I was looking at a wireless link? And these are the things that immediately came to my mind. Now here, and uh, Mark has asked, how far can one go using 5.8? I have a 21 mile distance from the studio to the transmitter. Alex, you've already beaten that, haven't you? Yeah. yeah I think yep. 30 was your record, it, if I recall. 30, 31 is my record, and it's a matter of gain at that point. Uh, yeah. You need a pretty big dish. And that comes back to the second from the bottom question, do we need more gain? Uh, so you need to increase the gain of the dish, and you need to realize that your bandwidth is going to be reduced right. if you want reliability. Uh, you, you do need to know the rules, do your homework, or call a company that understands them, like uh, Double Radius down in uh, the southeast. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, 5.8 gig uh, has a TPO limit on the radio. They can, they can only push so much power out of the radio. Uh, and then, but there's no ERP limit on a point-to-point -point link. Uh, right. So you can caveats. make it up within 10 a gig. So you can, you can throw a 12-foot dish on the thing and, and go mountaintop to mountaintop like they've done um, Las Vegas to L.A., Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that. Uh, it's uh, Central America. They've done stuff like that, and they, they try to do world records. And they'll bring the like decommissioned simul sats. I've seen people drag up to mountains to try and get distance records. Wow. Um, you know, wrong frequencies, but they're doing it anyway. I mean, I started out in wireless when uh, Pringles cans were kind of a cool idea. <laughs> uh, you know, so you know, put a def string between them or. Well, well it's kind of interesting when you make wireless. an end connector <laughs> and you shave off some ground wire and you solder it in and plug it into the radio and holy crap that actually worked um <laughs> you know some nuts and some washers and some all thread that worked too um i've even seen the guy who put a usb dongle on the end of a uh, deep fryer spider chinese uh, cooking spider and mm. use that as the reflector worked yeah. fine wow sure. yeah yeah so, so there, mean, there's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration when that, but those, those are the questions that you would ask exactly other than uh, line of sight, really? Well, uh, yeah, that, that, <laughs> okay, whatever. Wow. <laughs> autocorrect. I'm blaming autocorrect. All right. And he really needs to have you read these first, man. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've seen Alex's writing, so I'm not uh, not, not going to be spell checked. Um, so Ray Lewis mentions just did uh, link budgets for S band and C band Wi Fi this week using free software radio mobile. Good program, and that's uh, that that's a good point, and and that uh, actually is a good segue into the next side because there is some decent little free tools out there. Mm -hmm. And this is one that somebody mentioned to me just this morning, as a matter of fact. Do you want to take the credit for that one? Uh, if you want to give it to me, sure. <laughs> so, oh, by the way, speaking of credit where credit is due, um, shout out to, uh, I, I know he's not on the list, but if he ever watches the archive or if you happen to know him, because I see a couple of folks from up that neck of the woods, Eric Bernstead with uh, Magnum Media in uh, Wisconsin is the guy that coined the South Central Wisconsin backhoe in the wild so uh, if you That's see incredible. Eric, tell him we're taking his name in vain and uh, <laughs> you know the royalty check is in the mail but uh so hey what's that it is kind of a cool it's geared more for hams and it's just to see if you have a path yeah yeah this was uh this was taught to me 12 years ago during the initial initial dtv transition by uh, a really smart television engineer who has since passed on up in vermont he said they would get a lot of uh, get a lot of complaints from viewers when they turn their analog off, and you know, hey, we can't pick you up and stuff like that. So they would run, okay, based on their tower, and they knew what their height was. They would find the person's house, and look at it and say, you're shadowed by three mountains, just like the you know green link up on the top there. You know, yeah. okay, you're not going to pick anything up because you know refraction can only get you so far. So, so this is, we've done basic STL path plots on hmm. this just to see, is there a mountain in the way? Or, you know, when, I, when we moved into our new house, I wanted to see, am I going to little bit legitimately be able to pick up any of the Birmingham TV stations over the air? And yeah. I used this and I saw three mountains in the way. And I said, no, I'm not going to be able to pick up any of the Birmingham well, TV stations. And for what it's worth, um, what we're looking at here, the uh, westernmost point at the uh, left end of the red line is my house. 
the southernmost point just above Blandford is uh, the radio station and the northernmost point at the northern end of the green line is the studio. So mm. now you know why we have fiber from the radio station to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say. So. Now, one of the cool things about this is it does give you the ability in one of those menus, it gives you the ability to add height above ground. Mm -hmm. So you can actually compensate for, you know, OK, uh, you know, you pick the point and it knows what ground level is, but your antenna is 130 feet in the air. You can actually put plus 130 and it will add 130 feet to that. So you can figure out how much height you need to overcome physical obstacles. Obviously it doesn't yeah. account for buildings or, right. you know, tree growth, but it right. will at least account for rocks. Well, right. and that's, uh, we'll talk about some of the others and uh, Brad is mentioned here and uh, Brad, I'm gonna unmute you. Well, we're running out of time, so I'll just read it. But uh, Cambian has a great link called uh, Link Planner, a great tool rather that's free, but requires registration. Um, Calm Search, Calm Scope has a planner called IQ Link, which is free for up to 25 links. Hmm. So there are some options there. Um, Ubiquity, I'm going to skip ahead a Air couple Link. here. Yeah. Uh, the Ubiquity Error, uh, yeah, Air Link is it? I think yep. what it's called. Now, yep. the downside to this, so, and this is something I'm going to talk to a little bit. Uh, so this is point to point from where our studio was to where our transmitter is. And now this is a uh, 5.8 gig link and uh, I set the heights very specifically. And then I went into the Nautel, the uh, radio locator based uh, tool that we have, or radio mobile based tool that we have on our website and ran the same plot. And I had to really, well, when I ran it originally, the one thing that the air link does not allow for is all that green stuff. And we have a lot of old growth forest around here. Yep. So that was one issue. Now, obviously at 900 meg versus 5.8, you've got a much wider Fresnel zone. So that was also an issue. Um, so I jacked the height up till my main line cleared. And then I went to a 5.8 gig link. And that would have worked if I could get 75 meters up on a tower, which is not much taller than that. And that comes back to the whole, do you put your dish right behind your FM antenna? No, you don't. Mm -hmm. So again, in our situation, fiber was the answer. I'm gonna park it right there. Wikipedia actually has a really good explanation of uh, Fresnel zones. So uh, that's uh, something that you do need to pay attention to because I've run into situations with, uh, and, and I'm sure you guys both have, uh, Alex, uh, where uh, a truck going through can uh, mess up. Uh, you, you and I were talking about one where a delivery truck parked outside a so studio one day. What happened was, is the studios have been there for a number of years, had a 75 foot tower in the backyard for the STLs, and they had three sites being fed in three different directions. So it was a Christmas tree of dishes going this way, this way, and this way. And what had happened over the years is that they built an overpass over the main, the main highway became a main thoroughfare that they were right next to. So they built a giant overpass to get over to the grocery stores and stuff like that and take off the street light and stop sign. Well, that 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 thing got to be 50 60 feet tall so and guess what semis get over there to get over to the grocery store to make deliveries mm -hmm. so every morning like clockwork at 6 15 in the morning station would go off the air and they could not figure it out for the life of them and i went out there and i was outside just looking around having my morning coffee and here comes the delivery truck and i had the overhead speakers on and as soon as he cleared the light it turned off <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> I've had that conversation, believe it or not, more than once. Mm -hmm. I I got one, except it was a train. Mm -hmm. There every you time go. The every time the train would go by, the signal would disappear, and the owner could not figure out why. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's just, it's just random, and and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to, and it just sometimes it's for a you know a minute, sometimes it's for five minutes, and we just and I remember I got there. And I heard a train whistle, and 15 seconds later, it was off. Mm -hmm. And then the rumble stopped, and it came back on. I'm like, no. And I waited, and about 40 minutes later, I heard the train whistle, and it went off. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. needed to increase the height on their STL tower by about 40 feet, and the problem went away. 
and to allude more to what Josh was saying before with you know the Air Force Base where it says flip it from vertical to horizontal, a lot of the newer Wi-Fi network systems like the Ubiquities or the Dragon Waves and stuff have gone to a slant pole, uh, 45 mm -hmm. degrees. Yeah. Um, so your Fresnel zone is not like this anymore. It's not like this anymore. It's like this. So now you've got mm -hmm. a, a tube, you know, to, yeah. to account for. So, yeah. you know, you don't have to worry about what's to the left or the right. You got to worry ground and what's in the air on both axis, yeah. uh, axes to, to make sure you're clearing everything. That's the one thing a lot of these are not taking into consideration. Mm -hmm. is in the, these mobile these planning apps and, and of course the planning apps uh, best laid plans of mice and men put eyes on it you know yeah. if you can get a climber up there with or a drone pilot to come out uh and put eyes at the height where you need to go because i promise you you will see something that you didn't even know was there how about a water tower hiding in the trees <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, or the fake trees that are the gentrification trees, as I love to refer to them, you know, the cell towers <laughs> that are, don't have no place to be there. Yeah, you know, yeah. that pops up right in the middle of your path. And those are not accounted for in any of these planning apps. So make sure no. you lay eyes on that path before you well, start. And that is something that, uh, although it's not, I, I mean, it's not real time by any stretch and a, a cell tower can go up very literally in a Overnight. day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the uh, uh, the um, FCC info, the Cavell and Mertz uh, as the Google Earth plugin mm -hmm. that uh, helps a lot for some of that stuff for locating what towers may be in your vicinity. But if it's FCC, over 200 feet and listed, yes, and in, in the north right. in the U.S. But if it's a water tower, they're not usually uh, yeah. unless they're near unless they're near an airport. Uh, right. You know. Though those are the things that those are the challenges and, and don't uh, forget that uh, with wireless stuff like this if you're trying to plan a link you can and the nice thing about ip it's fast enough you can two hop mm -hmm. so if you don't have a clear line of sight find something that does and jump over and borrow some space from a, like a rooftop from a downtown building right. and get or sometimes, sometimes you can just shoot around something a little jog Correct. to the left a little jog to the right and there you go and, and that because uh, when you said uh, water tower i was thinking of eagle butte Mm -hmm. um, exactly that. So the, the site that Alex and I both worked on, where that was the situation between the the studio and the uh, transmitter. Mm -hmm. And same here at the the college. Here is a, a water tower showed up 20 years yep. after the radio station was there, and had been using this path for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And almost overnight, we're like, why did the signal just start going to crap on my 950? Yeah. Th there's nothing there that changed on the hill until you got out the binoculars, and all you saw was just a little parapet of the water tower. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, Stu Albert's throwing a couple of questions out here, and, and this comes back to the uh, the question earlier about bandwidth, and we were saying, well, you don't need a whole lot. And and his first question: Are there some wireless networks or wireless solution suggestions to transport WheatNet or S Axia nodes reliably? And, Several. Uh, and and so talk to those a little bit if you could, Alex. I know that's something that you've done a lot with. Yep. Um, you know, I do it over licensed six gig or previously licensed six gig uh, with uh, with Axia and I've done it with Wheatnet. Um, I've never successfully gotten Dante to work. Um, I'm probably doing something wrong, which everybody swears up and down you can do it. Never been able to do it. Uh, but the the dedicated links, uh, very careful planning of VLANs, make sure IGMP is taken into consideration. Um, mo mostly it's packets per second throughput it's not so much that you have you know in, in axia land you can do a live stream versus a standard stereo stream well a standard stereo stream is 200 packets per second mm -hmm. a live stream is 4000 so if the if the the radio cannot switch that many packets per second which a lot of the consumer and prosumer cannot mm -hmm. that's why you can't do live wire over your home linksys yeah. Uh, you know, it, it can't just it just can't keep up. So mm -hmm. those particular things have to be very considerate of being able to allow VLAN tagging, know your limitations, because if you're doing like a standard wheat net blade with eight channels of audio at 200 packets per second, that adds up. Right. You got to make sure that that equipment can handle that, um, you know, for an STL uh, specifically. So know so what I, your limits are. I argue against say if i held you against the wall and said what would do this what would your off the cuff right immediately what's the first thing you think of 
uh, I, I've done it with the Air Fiber 5X on the unlicensed side, and I've done it with the Dragon Wave 6 gig stuff on the license band. Okay. So second part of the of uh, Stu's question because it's a two parter question and why would uh, why would we not have a little more fun with it? Um, and this one comes into something that we see a lot with HD radio too, but he's looking specifically at uh, TSOIP traffic uh, television, mm -hmm. and he needs a, a low or fixed um, latency uh, solution to transport about 40 megabits of uh, of TSOIP. And that's the challenge. Like, and he mentions ubiquity works, but the latency seems too variable. And it's not so the latency that's really the variable there. It's the jitter that is actually right. causing the problem in that, uh, because TSOIP is um, uh, is is very jitter sensitive in packet order. Not yep. so much the latency, because you can buffer out latency like nobody's business, especially in television, where I can put eight seconds of buffer on either end and it'll catch up just fine. But mm -hmm. the jitter is where it's going to get you. Um, yeah. And th in that respect, license has managed to figure out how jitter works the best. Um, so your six gig, 11 gig, that's why you see a lot of those advertised more for television STLs than you do radio. Okay. They're more so high, high, gig, high gig license band stuff. Is there one brand or another that, uh, that seems to play better in your mind? And again, keeping in yeah. mind, this is subjective. Yeah, right. Uh, Cadmium is always a good player in that game. Dragon Wag, Dragon Wave, Liga Wave. Um, you know, like I said, reach out to your wireless vendors. Um, I personally like using um, Double Radius. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they know their stuff. They've been doing it for years and they actually understand media and broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, unlike a lot of the guys, when you tell them you want to try do TSO IP, a lot of guys will just look at you like, what? Yeah. I mean, Double Radius I, knows how to, they've dealt with it. They've done it. Right. So, I worked with them for a few years, but Jeff down there was always really good for stuff like that. Yep, yet I, another Jeff. <laughs> name was easy to remember. What can I say? So, yep. Stu, there's the, and that kind of is a segue because one of the challenges we see with HD radio, there's a lot of talk, of course, about uh, delay, uh, wandering mm -hmm. delay correction. Uh, and my argument has always been that uh, you can use a receiver to correct the you're not solving the symptom or the problem you're solving the symptom of the wandering delay by using receiver to dynamically adjust your own delay to compensate but if you do the clocking and lock the get the fix the dither the jitter whatever then there are other ways to fix that and mm -hmm. you you've uh, been playing with some ways to solve the problem totally by just making a constant path correct R right exactly so i mean if, if you look at the way that uh, as a lot of things in broadcast are as we lovingly refer to them as bolt-ons mm -hmm. uh, you know just like car mods you know they're a bolt-on modification hd radio was no different uh for the broadcast industry it was a bolt-on uh, right. So it has its own specification. It uses its own thing, and we bolted it onto what we already had, which was our 950 links going dedicated through a microwave shot. But we need IP for the HD radio side, whether it be transporting the audio to the codec to the importer exporter at the transmitter, or transferring E2X as mm -hmm. a whole payload. Well, IP has inherent latency, has inherent jitter. Uh, you know, there's firewalls, there's routers. What if you're using public internet? You have no control over the route. Um, you know, things like that. Well, whereas your standard FM signal still just goes right over the 950 link, no problem, right? Yeah. Even if you do like a LAN link where you've got the, the IP running along that 950, it's still got an encoding delay because it's IP. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge is, is that you are, you're creating that problem yourself and, yeah. and it's inherent to HD radio in general. So the idea that we had uh, a year or so ago now was, what if we put the FM and the HD in the same payload yeah. and move them together? Then at that point, you eliminate You don't the have the because... chance to move it. Yeah. It right. can't move. Oh, also, side note, talking about the, um, the Fresnel zones and obstacles, uh, Scott Clifton mentions a website where you can put in your sites, download a KML file to look at in Google Earth in conjunction with other KML files like the ones we mentioned on the Cavell Mertz, the FCC info website, lets mm -hmm. you see obstacles. Uh, Ed, I'm going to, if you're uh, here and uh, can grab the, uh, the link that Scott posted in questions and uh, throw it into chat. But it's uh, Radio Fresnel, R-A-D-I-O-F-R-E-S-N-E-L dot com. 
Uh, no oh, point seeing that site. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So I think Scott I'll might have actually told me about it. So yeah. yeah. So shout out to Scott for that. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, oh no, we covered that. I think we're ready to roll. Carrying on. So we do have our RF cool toolkit, which, as I said, is uh, is um, is, is basically created and maintained by Roger Couday with uh, of uh, Radio Mobile fame. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to screw it up. Yep. So if, if I screw it up, that's on me, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll take the beating. Um, if you go to our uh, website, notel.com, uh, over to the right, you got the little link that says support. Click on that. It'll take you to a page where you can click on uh, RF Toolkit and uh radio coverage tool will be there you have to be a users group member um, i think somebody in marketing probably tracks every time you do something and at some point they'll probably start sending it to the sales guys and most of us i will anyway will ignore it but uh so <laughs> apologies to the marketing folks however the point is that uh if you log in there you do have the ability to uh do point to point uh path measurement with uh with um, foliage, ground cover, et cetera, and so on. Again, I can't tell you if the cell company threw a tower up between my studio and my transmitter, but I can tell you what Mother Nature is putting away. So it, it's a good start. Um, and, and that comes back. Now, Alex, uh, I know you've used this once or twice. Oh, yeah, several times. Yeah. Yep. So, and and then in, in conjunction with the coverage tool, just the same, as well as the link tool, because they, yeah. they're, they're two birds of the same feather, you know? It, it, right they really do coordinate very nicely to each other um one and, thing that i always want to push on to people though too again is you know don't put these links whether it's a marty 950 or a land link or a ubiquity or a dragon wave radio don't put them right next to a high power fm antenna uh yeah. you know that's just asking for trouble and you're going to spend a lot of money trying to diagnose it so if you've got if you need 500 feet on one side and you've your antennas you know 600 feet tall you know right. getting it right next to the fm base is never going to end well they are yeah. after all again little computers yeah and if you look like for us to do a clear 950 shot and even then we're totally killing the fresnel zone with the trees Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it required a 40 meter, so about 140 foot uh, tower at the studio end in a subdivision where we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. And it required us to go up almost uh, 300 feet on the tower end on a 350 foot tower with a two bay on top plus some power company stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so in our situation, again, wireless as a single hop anyway, became a non-issue, a non-starter. Mm -hmm. Now, higher frequency helped. But again, you need the heights to get the clearance. So uh, that's right. the kind of thing that you do pay attention to. And like I said, we've got the tool there. I, I put the link here. That is an old link because mm -hmm. uh, we are HTTPS on everything now. So uh, go to Nautel.com and click the support tab on the right and then just follow. It'll direct you right to it. The other the other modern day fun you can do with this stuff is I've used the Ubiquity uh, integrated, you know, the pie pan dishes as I call them, you know, they're, they're like 70 bucks a piece. Uh, mm -hmm. Hot AM towers. Uh, mm -hmm. Use them as, to cross a base insulator. Uh, that's what, that's what I did. That's what the 60 gigahertz link is. Yep. Yeah. So you power them by your tower lights that are already isolated on the other side, hang a box up there, put a switch in and whoop, you two hop mm -hmm. it right across the base. Works yep. perfect for that. Yeah. Um, you, you can't that's, beat it. <laughs> some, that, that's something you see an awful lot. I mean, you know, it's the faster than setting up, well, any kind of, uh, mm -hmm. I'm having a brain fart, but any kind of uh, isocoupler. Yeah. You know, well, and we, what, we, what we've also done is uh, on a lot of ours, especially on the higher power AMs, if you don't want to string Cat 5 up a 50 kilowatt AM tower, you string mm -hmm. fiber and put a media converter in the box at each end. Yep. yep. And then that way you can kind of isolate everything into that box and all you've got going up the tower is a piece of glass. So your yeah. the, the radios are isolated from each other. They'll gotta get yeah. the power up there. So you yeah. gotta tap a tower light or whatever. Right. Um but yeah, you know, there there are ways around that nowadays. And and, and if you have um and I, I shouldn't even say a competent AM engineer because any AM engineer has to be competent to do their job. Uh mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're you're playing with some pretty high power stuff. 
uh, mm -hmm. they'll know exactly what you need. Um, for instance, I have one here where we had to uh, encase the cables in, it, we did the fiber trick, uh, but the power yeah. cables were still the problem. So we had to yeah. put the power in conduit right. uh, mm -hmm. to shield it and bond it, um, yeah. things like that. So, so using it for, uh, you know, if you've got a multiplex AM array, which is becoming more and more popular, where you need to deliver several signals at once and telemetry for seven towers. Yeah, yeah this is a way to do that very easily mm -hmm. um, and inexpensively. I mean, you know, the, the sticker shock is definitely gone. I mean, when I called a brand M of any kind in the past, you know, you were fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even before Tower Cruise, that was just equipment. And right. frequency coordination and calling up uh, someone like Com Search to do the study for you and do the notifications. Uh, you, know, you still have to do that in six gig. I get piles of them every day for uh, 5G LTE stuff right now. Mm -hmm. But the 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 fact is is you know for a modest investment, three to five thousand dollars, including your tower crew, yeah, you can you can light up a heck of a link right. and yeah. get what you need. And that's where this stuff is just really, it, it's really evolved, hence the LTE. Long-term evolution. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the non traditional over. Oh, God, where did that come from? What All right. Well, that? That, that's one of Josh's wall of texts. I that's did, awful. I, Why did you put that up there? That's awful. Hey, well, I don't know. Maybe you need a marketing person. Maybe um, I do. <laughs> you, you can't have it. He's ours. But... Uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, just uh, give you a couple of seconds. We're already over time. So a couple of seconds to talk about the Max Connect. And uh, then I want to hit the uh, telephone service that you provide more, probably even more. Okay. Uh, but um, um, I think we've already hit most of the Max Connect stuff. Uh, uh, oh, pri enough. Priority wireless. Oh. Uh, and, yeah. oh, that looks even worse. What are you doing here? Jeez. You're making me look bad. This is what happens when you send me stuff and uh, don't uh, ask me to reformat it and I just plug it in cold. Ed, don't but, let him do this anymore. Jeez. Yeah, Ed, don't let me do this anymore. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, but this is one of the cool things that you can do. It, it's getting harder and harder to get uh, plain old telephone service like POTS lines, copper, and strung. It so, is. I, I, you know, Verizon and AT&T have both decommissioned a lot of wire centers, especially in the Northeast, and it's it's showing up in other parts of the country where they're just turn, saying, you know, you'll get a notice, hey, we're decommissioning copper service. CenturyLink nationwide, starting with Minnesota. Yeah, and they you are... You allowed them to decommission the copper plant? And the VoIP that you get from the, the cable companies is trash. It doesn't decode DTMF correctly, things like that. We have a VoIP solution that, you know, our ATAs will actually properly decode and generate DTMF. So it can right. call you reliably. And when you call into your remote control, whether it's a, a plus touch uh, or a, you know, Gentner VRC 2000 or a sign systems you know, whatever. We've tested it with all the remote controls. It works reliably on all of them. And it's like 17 bucks a month. Yeah. And and you don't even have to get a Max Connect internet service with it. It'll work with any phone service. So it, or I'm sorry, with any yeah. internet service. So if you have internet at your site yeah. and you just want a POTS line cheap, give us a call. There so. you go. All right. So on that note, I want to thank you guys for this uh, today. This has been a lot of fun. As always, all of our webinars are archived. You can hit them up on the uh, notel.com website under resources and webinars. Uh, you can go to the Waves newsletter. A new one came out. Ooh, I, I, I keep saying a couple of weeks ago. I think that was last week. Them. I'm going to say, I think we're into the month ago now almost. Um, but time flies. Like I was talking about something that happened just the other day, not too long ago. And that the other day turned out to be 32 years ago. Um, so <laughs> all kind of relative. As you get older, the time gets closer and closer. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. That's uh, where the support guys, uh, in addition to the support section of our website under tech resources, the YouTube channel, you can find... Uh, Little how-to things on, you know, if somebody asks Alex the same question over and over, then uh, he may actually make a little bit. I haven't seen a lot of Alex videos. We usually try to get somebody a little more photogenic, but that's all. Yeah, thing. there's actually some really good ones in there for with uh, Steve on how to test your FETs uh, if you have a XR series. Yeah, and uh, online info, I mean, I've got Barry Mishkin's uh, BDR, the broadcaster's desktop resource. Barry does his uh, Thursday lunch sessions too, where we shoot the breeze about whatever happens to be the topic of the week. 
Um, there are other ones, you know, the Facebook page is Transmitter Sites Broadcasting Club. There's uh, broadcastengineering.info, which is a very engineer oriented, uh, not a whole lot of fluff in that one. And it has a very specific place. So all kinds of resources out there. Uh, by all means, we could almost do a whole session on uh, just the different places you can find stuff these days. Yeah. And as we get more younger people who don't know all the answers, to, uh, wait, I can't qualify for that anymore, I don't think. But uh, yeah, Josh almost Alex, does. Alex and I used to be able to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're both old dogs now. <laughs> so on, on that note, we're 12 minutes past the top of the hour, which is about where we always seem to end these things. Um, Alex, I want to thank you for taking some time. Uh, John Wilton, mm -hmm. if you're paying attention, thanks for letting them have us or letting us have them for a little while. If you're not paying attention, Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on that note, thanks very much, Alex. Josh, thanks very much. I know you've got uh, a day and a half planned today. Today is a day of meetings for you. So Absolutely, yeah. One on with that you. note, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, folks, thank you. thank you very much for spending the past hour and 13 minutes with us. It's truly been a pleasure, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye now. Thanks, guys.